I'm very grateful to be here chairing this panel. One of the things that the story of Asia-Pacific economic growth and integration has given us is a wonderful set of metaphors. We've had tigers, flying geese, dragons, tiger cubs, uh, wolf warriors. But in relation to trade, I think the metaphor that I grew up with was that of the noodle bowl. And nearly 30 years ago, um, Jagdish Bhagwati, the very much a proponent of free trade, actually I think he called it the spaghetti bowl of regional trade agreements that was already growing in the region uh, in the 1990s. And since then, they have proliferated. Um, in many ways now, the discourse around regional trade agreements suggests that they are an absolute lifeline for trade um, and a bulwark against protectionism. But they also often carry some fish hooks um, and what one of my colleagues referred to as pockets of protection. So to canvas the regional trade and regional trade agreement scenario, I'm delighted to introduce our panel. We have an absolutely first-rate lineup. Um, I will briefly introduce each speaker. So Kristen Bondietti, who has come across the Tasman, um, is Program Director, Trade Policy and Research at the Australian Apex Studies Centre at RMIT University. She has enormous experience as an advisor and analyst of international trade, trade policy and regulatory issues relating to trade, um, and is an international lawyer and economist by training. Dr. Shiro Armstrong, also an economist by training at um, ANU, um, is director or associate professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy and director of the Australia Japan Research Centre, um, and a very prolific writer on issues relating to regional trade and Australia foreign relations. Um, Dr. Chris Noonan, on my right. Uh, associate Professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Auckland, uh, an expert on competition and company law and trade regulation, and particularly international competition law. And uh, Dr. Rob Scully, on my left, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Economics at the Business School at the University of Auckland, uh, long-time previous director of the APEC Studies Centre, and well-known analyst and researcher on regional trade integration issues. So each speaker will um, present initially for, for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will open up for Q&A. Um, Kristen, please. Okay, thank you, Natasha. And Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, be in a room among New Zealand friends and esteemed colleagues, and also because talking about trade and evolving developments in trade, which is the brief today, is actually one of my favourite things to do, so I'm very excited. Um, what I'd like to do in my allocated time is just start by outlining some of the broad factors that are driving changes in the trade landscape, just, I think, to help set the scene. And then what I'll do is just highlight what I see as maybe the three key challenges that, and developments that are occurring with a little bit of a focus on Australia. So I think it's, it's no secret and everyone in the room knows that we're currently in a period of time where the trade landscape is evolving and regional integration and globalisation is evolving. And there are a number of factors that are simultaneously happening and occurring in the landscape today. So the other day I was listening to a podcast from the CSIS, the Trade Guys. You may, may know that podcast in the United States. And to borrow their words, I think they summed it up really nicely and they pointed to sort of three broad uh, drivers that are happening. First is coming from governments. We've heard about the geopolitics this morning and there's also obviously the regional setting as well. I'm sure some of my colleagues will talk more about this later, but some of the big traders we now know, it's true to say, are no longer in favour of, I would say, economic integration. They're thinking more about trade in terms of national security and economic vulnerabilities, so critical minerals, technology, for example. 
And at the same time, the domestic politics are also no longer looking towards the open markets and trade as the future, as perhaps was happening in the mid-2000s, but are becoming more domestic focused. So you would have heard, but we're seeing a lot more inward-looking policies, reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, and a major surge in industrial policies and tech nationalism. So that's what governments are doing generally. Secondly, companies are reassessing economic and geopolitical risks. So in the wake of COVID, there's a lot now that's happening and impacting on supply chains. There's government policies, there's trade barriers, there's supply shortages, there's technology. And many companies now, and of course I'm just speaking generally, are focusing on building supply chain resilience and efficiency. In particular, they're adjusting to get more diverse sources of supply, and as we've heard a little bit about, heard a little bit this morning, sources outside of China as well. Thirdly, we have demographics driving economic changes. For example, as populations shrink in China, labour costs rise, production bases are shifting to other countries as well, such as Southeast Asia. And fourth, I'd add on to that, we're also seeing the evidence of new issues that are impacting on trade that have no overarching or guiding policy frameworks. And I'm talking here about some of the issues that were raised this morning, frameworks for climate transition, for regulation of the digital economy, for supporting more inclusive growth, for example. So this evolving landscape in which these factors are at play is raising challenges for trade. And as I see it, challenges and developments, there are three key ones. The first is the growing policy fragmentation. The geopolitics are impeding deep cooperation that we've seen building since the mid 2000s and generating a lack of trust in integration. And to an extent, this has been exacerbated by the pandemic, during which cooperative policy activity, talking to people face to face, was more limited. We're seeing diverging trade frameworks emerging as well, driven by a whole range of factors. And as Natasha pointed out with the noodle bowl, this is not new, but the differences in the approaches among the major traders are now more marked. We have the CPTPP and RCEP on one hand, we have IPEF also going on, we have par essentially paralysis in the WTO. And the divergence in these emerging frameworks is greater in some areas more than others. For example, policy on state-owned enterprises, national security and trade, environmental subsidies, and also digital trade. I thought it was interesting that the, um, the Pacific Economic Co Cooperation Council, the PEC State of the Region report that was put out last year, in that report, which is a survey of informed commentators and business across the region, over one third of the respondents selected a fragmenting global economy as a risk to growth, making it the fourth most frequent risk. So again, this points out not only fragmentation as a risk to business, to integration, but on the flip side, it also demonstrates the recognition of the value of integration as a driver of growth as well, which is suffering. So we have policy fragmentation. We also have, secondly, trade and investment shifting as supply chains adjust to trade and to policy and economic changes. Now, I mentioned before um, trade diversification. Southeast Asia, for example, has been a particular beneficiary of trade and investment diversification out of China. Boston Consulting Group predicts it will benefit from an estimated $1 trillion in US dollars in new trade through to 2031, due in large part to new commerce with China, Japan, the US and the EU. And this is not only driven by the geopolitical trends, but also the region's lower costs and its growing manufacturing capabilities. Interestingly, ASEAN's trade with China has also expanded. This is both as China has shifted away from the US, with some of US policies, um, and also as ASEAN has grown in its capabilities, ASEAN has now surpassed the European Union to become China's largest trading partner. Uh, trade grew by 
28% in 2021. China's increasing its FDI in the Southeast Asian region and ASEAN China trade is expected to grow by over 438 billion, again by 2031, which is the largest inter-regional increase um, that we'll probably see in the region. So what does this mean? Well, many economies, including Australia, are now thinking about how they, they too can integrate more closely with Southeast Asia and integrate into the regional value chains that are shifting. Just an example for Japanese apparel and textile firms, for example, used to manufacture in China, are now increasingly manufacturing in Indonesia and Cambodia to take advantage of lower labour costs as they rise in China, though they are continuing to source technology and materials from China upstream, as well as Japan. And we've also, won't go into any detail, but we've heard about Vietnam being a major beneficiary of Western investment and trade as well, more recently. So we have policy fragmentation, we have shifting supply chains and patterns. We're also seeing, thirdly, the rise of the services and innovation economy, which is becoming more important. A lot of technology recently has impacted on the trade landscape. I don't need to tell you about digitisation and its impacts. But a lot of this activity, and what I think is often missed in the debate, is that it's very closely linked with services. So digitisation has expanded services trade, not just in pure digital services like ICT and commerce, but also in digitally enabled areas of the economy. So, for example, non-digital services trade in APEC um, actually dropped 44% during the pandemic, but the digital services trade of APEC during this time actually rose um, when it actually de de declined globally. So, in essence, we're seeing new ways of doing, of doing services businesses emerging. Some commentators pointing to a new era of trade and overall growth that's going to be based on services. And in essence, this is partly due to the role that services play, plus skills and digitisation, in becoming more important across all areas of ac economic activity. So the services value add in Apex gross manufactured exports, data for economies that are available, is now 45%, which is up from 41% a decade ago. So services now are contributing more to trade and trade as a value add and input into goods trade as well. And of course, I don't, just as I mentioned off the offside, that barriers do remain. Even though services is becoming more important, there are still a high level of domestic regulatory impediments that exist in services, which are generally twice as high as those for goods. So in this evolving landscape of policy fragmentation, shifting economic trends, and the rise of services and innovation, what are some of the challenges and opportunities for Australia? Well, integration will remain a critical source of growth for Australia and for almost all economies in the region. It does, and it will likely continue to do so in the future. We simply just can't make everything we need ourselves, and we can't sell everything that we make into our own domestic market. So a key challenge for Australia is to continue to push for collaborative policy making that helps to reconcile some of the diverging approaches we're seeing helps to bring back trust to some of the relationships that has been lacking in recent years and make the benefits of integration known. And when I talk about integration here, I mean removing barriers to trade, to investment, to allow economies to exchange with each other and to pursue common interests and cooperate. For example, on you know, improving their efficiency, improving competitiveness, shared goals and interests. It's very difficult, I know, to change things at the moment. Um, we, in, some, in APEC, we tend not to, to mention liberalisation at the moment. But we need to be patient and strategic and be focused on the long-term opportunities. So while the benefits of integration might not be resonating now, it might be different, say, in 10 years' time. A second challenge that we face, given these uh, developments, is competing in the region. We need to think about where we fit into these evolving supply chains. We can look to regional growth areas like Southeast Asia, 
but the market is competitive, as I pointed out. We're competing with trade with a whole range of traders there. To me, it makes sense to focus on where we can be globally competitive, as always. And here, a key strength of Australia's is in services. And as I said before, this is not just services in their own right as exports, such as education or travel or financial services, but also services that provide the value add for broader economic activity. So we need services to move goods. We need services to operationalise investments. We need services if we're going to start tackling new issues such as climate change. And the challenges here are twofold. Obviously, the first one is continuing to improve our own competitiveness, by that I mean Australia's, for example, in logistics and essential services. And the importance of this was very evident during the pandemic, where it was very difficult to move even goods in and out of our country. And the other challenge is continuing to support structural reform and to reduce barriers in other markets. And this is not only for market access for us, but it's also because our trading partners in Southeast Asia, for example, also need open and efficient services to take advantage of new investments and changes in supply chains that we hopefully would want to link into. And of course, the difficulty of the movement of labour and skilled workers are also other elements that we need to consider when we're supporting the services economy. And finally, no less challenging, is how to address some of the new trade issues that are emerging. And I'm sure this will be a key topic and area of discussion and focus over the next few days. As a sort of, I guess, overall view, we, I think we need to be creative in developing and encouraging trade frameworks here in ways that build trust and support integration. For example, if we're going to develop the green economy, we're going to need goods, we're going to need services, we're going to need technology and we're going to need skills to operationalise difficult word, our investments and drive innovation. And we can already see some new types of frameworks emerging to address these issues. For example, the Australia-Singapore Green Economy Agreement um, is an example of a, a different type of framework to address some of those issues. So I guess in summary, and the question is in this evolving trade environment a framework we're seeing is how best do we use the tools we have to address the challenges we face? What are the policies that will help us become competitive in the regional market, in the global market? And what are the frameworks that will help drive and support integration over the longer term? And how can technology help? No, I don't have the answers. That's for you and for <laughs> our fellow panellists. But um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to, to talk to you about these challenging issues. Um, uh, look, I want to really take a step back and, and reflect a bit, I think, and connect a bit to what was talked about in the first panel. Um, and when we're thinking about developments in global trade, I'm going to talk about the threat to the international economic order and what we might be able to do about it. So the minister this morning was very polite, didn't mention the United States or China when he was talking about the big threats and challenges we face. Um, I'm not going to be quite as polite uh, and explain um, some of the challenges we're facing from uh, the United States and, and China to global trade. So first of all, I think we're seeing an increasingly assertive China uh, that's used economic leverage against other countries, um, most uh, blatantly and recently against Australia. Uh, but more worrying really is we are facing a United States that's walking away from a leadership role in the global trading system. It's in fact not only walking away from a leadership role, it's becoming a source of uncertainty. We can no longer enforce WTO rules now thanks to US veto on, on judges to the appellate body. And we have the United States trashing the WTO with its abuse of the national security exemption, exemption. Uh, most obviously and, and worryingly last December when US Trade Representative Catherine Tai um, made that quite clear. So we've got a US administration that's moving from multilateralism to minilateralism um, and minilaterals or regional agreements that are exclusive of China. Uh, this is different from the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership era, where the United States still 
uh, doubled down on the WTO and, and multilateral trade, uh, but now as a threat to the global system, focusing on things like IPEF instead as a substitute. And of course, we have strategic competition between the United States and China. Add to all of that and the, the challenges that the minister mentioned, uh, of course, WTO rules are out of date and the re regional and plurilateral agreements we have are patchy in their coverage and their membership. So this is a big threat, I would argue, to our national and global prosperity. I think the, the bilateral and regional agre agreements we have that do make up the multilateral trading system, it's important to recognise that these are built on top of the WTO and these um, create the, the, the system as a whole um, and the scaffolding that holds our economies together. And our part of the world in East Asia relies on this multilateral system more than any other region in the world because of the economic ties that have helped us manage, and I say us collectively, think about Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, manage relations between states that have systemic political differences, you know, unresolved history, political rivalry, and so on. And Japan and China, um, a case in point. Third largest trading relationship in the world, second and third largest economies, and until recently have only operated under a WTO framework. RCEP brings them into an agreement for the first time. The worrying thing now, and what I want to just focus on, is partly what's happening to, to trade and to thinking about this in security terms, uh, and then come back to reassert the strategic value and security value of the WTO and multilateral system. Because I think it's quite clear to recognise, and it was touched on in the first panel, we now have security considerations starting to affect economic considerations, if not dominate them. The post-war economic system protected against the blatant use of economic aggression and economic weapons that led to conflict uh, in the interwar period. Now we're seeing an entanglement of economics and national security and the return of economic weaponry. Uh, this is of course due to great power strategic rivalry and both major powers intervening in markets for domestic political, but also geopolitical and strategic reasons. So we're hearing more and more about the weaponization of trade, securitization of trade, weaponization of interdependence, and geoeconomics, the use of economic tools in pursuit of geopolitical objectives. Of course, uh, as Kristen and others have, have mentioned, we're seeing friendshoring, protectionist industrial policy, technology decoupling, uh, and the worry is if these trends get worse, uh, we could be seeing uh, a China that's not as deeply integrated into the global economy. Uh, and just the question in the first panel about what kind of China we want to see in the future, um, I was at a, a, a involved in a round table last year with a senior Chinese strategist who, who posed this question, what kind of China do we want to see in the future? We have to be very careful um, we don't end up with another North Korea, but a thousand times bigger. Uh, a China that's not deeply integrated into the global economy uh, scares me uh, greatly. We're in a world where positive sum economic exchange is becoming viewed as zero sum or even negative sum. Uh, and what I mean by that, of course, with the weaponization of trade and interdependence, Interdependence is seen as a vulnerability, not a source of prosperity and a source of security. Just think about economic competition. It's about making yourself better. For a country, it's about improving education, improving productivity, improving competitiveness. Security competition is about undermining the other, the, the perceived enemy. And in the process of that zero sum, it could be negative sum, uh, also undermining yourself um, and unleashing measures of self-harm. Now, I think this is a false binary um, and a false dichotomy that we're in danger of, of um, realising and living out. Um, our interactions in the region between other countries, big and small, uh, of course, are mixed interest games, a mix of positive and zero-sum games, and we need to keep that in mind. So, just with a few minutes left um, to talk about uh, what we can do about it, and, and I think this will be the topic of discussion for the rest of today and, and tomorrow. I get another bite of the cherry tomorrow. 
um, to talk about the regional trade aspects of this. Uh, but I think what I want to focus on to end this is just to, to emphasize and explain the security value of the WTO and the multilateral system. Um, you know, we're at risk of not recognizing the peace dividend from economic exchange and just seeing the zero sum aspects. Uh, now this, of course, is hard when the United States um, uh, is trashing the system and we have great power strategic rivalry, but the rest of the wor world is pretty big, minus China and the United States. Uh, and I think it's pretty important to protect multilateralism and is system preservation and reform of the system. Uh, and this is important, um, not just strategically, I think, but we can look at parts of our world where and we talked about choices Australia is trying to avoid making and how Southeast Asia has not been making these, having to make these choices, wants to avoid making choices between China, the United States, security, economics. Multilateralism can preserve this policy space, preserves policy options, and diffuses economic and political power. If you need to see where this is being um, effectively still, um, uh, where this is still effective, I think you don't need to look further than ASEAN in Southeast Asia. So I think what can small economies like ourselves, small open economies do, uh, faced with all these big challenges? Well, I want to, of course, talk about the importance of rules, uh, but importantly, um, markets, international markets, and how they can protect us. And here, I think we can draw some lessons from the recent um, trade sanctions that Australia's faced from China. Uh, and the ability of Australian exporters to find alternative markets. That was all due to having an open multilateral trading system and other markets being open for Australian exporters to adjust to. Of course, it was crucial, and another necessary condition was to have flexible markets domestically. You know, flexible labour markets, flexible exchange rate, and flexible economy. It's the multilateralism that diffuses that external power or the economic and political power and becomes a source of resilience for countries like Australia and New Zealand. Multilateral system and open contestable markets blunt the use of economic weapons and reduce the costs for those targeted countries like Australia in this case. You know, unilateral sanctions um, have, have unintended consequences and they often backfire. So I think you can look at a lot of episodes of unilateral sanctions and more broadly bigger sanctions um, that are used beyond you know, pretty narrow definitions of trying to preserve peace to geoeconomic weaponry or for coercion. And there are very few cases, I challenge people to find cases where they've succeeded. Uh, quite often they backfire economically and politically or both. So that's the security value of the open multilateral trading system. Um, and it's not just about um, the rhetoric about the WTO and having someone in, in Geneva negotiating, this is where we need political capital, political will to defend the system. And for small open economies, it's not just the rules, of course. The, the case of Australia shows us it's, it's integration into these markets that can protect us. And the lesson I think we want to take away from this is it's important to keep the large powers, China and the United States, enmeshed in more rules and more markets. So how we keep China and the United States engaged in rulemaking and multilateralism and how we enmesh them in more markets, uh, I think is, is what we're going to talk about for the rest of today. And like Chris and I, I raise more questions than answers, uh, but look forward to the discussion in answering those. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to talk today. Um, I want to sort of take you from sort of the, the big to the small to some extent. And I was asked to sort of um, talk to you today about sort of um, Pacific Islands and trade in the Pacific Islands. And that's because of sort of I've sort of been involved as sort of as a trade advisor for the Pacific on and off part time for probably 20 years. And so I have bring quite a different view. I sort of have a view from sort of the trenches to some extent, rather than sort of a broad sort of geostrategic view of things. 
And so that makes me sort of a bit like sort of, you know, the, in the parable, the blind man and the elephant. I see, I've seen little bits of things and I sort of don't necessarily have a big sense of the, the whole picture as well. And so sort of thinking about sort of the developments and, and sort of how this may sort of impact sort of the Pacific Islands. You know, there are a range of different sort of issues that have been of concern to sort of developing countries as well. And some of them we've talked about as well, sort of, you know, the energy and food prices, insecurity of food supply, the pandemic, the trips waiver, supply chains shortening, um, the importance of digital trade and, and sort of what the Pacific needs to do, take advantage of that. Sort of, you know, the rebound in tourism in Fiji and whether that's sustainable. There's a whole lot of things that are very important and sort of the strategic sort of context within the Pacific as well. But I probably want to sort of talk to you about a few more specific, small-scale things as well. And you know, I, I talk in my own capacity, I'm not sort of representing anyone. And when you sort of think about things from sort of the Pacific point of view, sort of capacity constraints are a real major issue for an engagement in trade and sort of, and they sort of limit the type of trade engagement that the Pacific has. Um, over sort of my time working with the Pacific, sort of I reckon that sort of every five years the capacity of, of the officials in the islands sort of doubles in, in terms of sort of trade. But there is a certain point where it sort of reaches a sort of a, a limitation and sort of with the size of the bureaucracies, the number of people, people, small staffs, they're forced to be generalists and cover a whole range of different sort of negotiations, a whole range of different issues. There are sort of, sort of limits to really sort of what can or can't be achieved in that as well. And so that sort of takes me back a little bit about sort of thinking about sort of the direction of trade within the, the Pacific and, and what's likely to happen as well. So, the Pacific sort of, um, you know, there has been over the years attempts to negotiate trade agreements amongst themselves. You've got PICTA, you've got MSGTA, and probably, you know, there's been a degree of enthusiasm for that over the years. But now you probably see the countries realizing and, and looking outside of the region for the trade options more than sort of within inside the region as well. Understanding that sort of the bigger markets, whether it's Australia or New Zealand or ASEAN or China, become more important than sort of um, than each other as sort of mechanisms to sort of enhance their growth and, and sort of trade. The, um, the Pacific sort of has attempted to sort of negotiate as a group collectively with sort of the EU and, and sort of the EPA negotiations and Australia and New Zealand and PESA Plus. But when you sort of look at the trade patterns of um, the Pacific, I mean, a number of the islands have strong trade relationships with one or other Asian country. And, but again, as a group, there's no sort of obvious sort of individual partner for that as well. And sort of the, the restrictions and the limits on trade capacity sort of makes it sort of unlikely that the Pacific sort of really will sort of want to sort of negotiate sort of major trade agreements with sort of a, a lot of other countries. There's sort of just sort of natural limits on what's possible. Um, more interesting, I mean, there's been, of course, sort of um, overtures by some countries. China has been interested in negotiating trade agreements with several of the islands. Um, you know, there's been one feasibility study completed, as far as I know. But there is sort of, there's sort of limits to what's sort of likely to be achieved. And we have the, the US has sort of re-entered and become more engaged in the region, and particularly in the southern part of the region. And that's sort of been welcomed positively. And, and sort of, a, you know, the USTR is sort of asking sort of the um, International Trade Commission to sort of put some thought into what is the trade and, and sort of investment relationship between the Pacific. I mean, the US is not negotiating trade agreements. So if there is to be some sort of improvement, or some sort of improved market access or trade opportunities, and there's likely to be sort of in the form of sort of a GSP or some sort of improved GSP or a GOA type arrangement. So there's sort of limits to what we sort of can sort of really expect in the future. Um, but if I can sort of take you to, so this sort of not necessarily join together points, but if I can take you to sort of the WTO and, and we've heard sort of the WTO is dysfunctional. I mean, it's dysfunctional in different ways to different people and different groups. And so, 
the way that the WTO is dysfunctional to New Zealand or Australia is not necessarily how it's felt by some of the other countries as well. I mean, the Pacific is sort of represented, there's three permanent missions in, in sort of Geneva for six WTO Pacific Island countries as well. Um, there is one office for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat there, and it's probably sort of in terms of trade better resourced than sort of any of the individual missions. There's very limited capacity to engage in full range of WTO issues. So the Pacific needs to be strategic and focus on things that really matter. And on that, I sort of, sort of, you know, we can sort of look at sort of um, the fishery subsidies agreement was mentioned by Minister O'Connor, and I think it's the topic of conversation tomorrow as well. But this is an area where the Pacific has made an impact. The agreement wouldn't look like it does now if it wasn't for the Pacific. If you look at the agreement itself, from a fish point of view, it's a failure. It really doesn't achieve very much at all. It's only with the insistence, really, of the Pacific that there is this continuation of negotiations to try and deal with overfishing and overcapacity as well. So the Pacific was, in relatively unique circumstances, able to exercise a degree of influence over that sort of process as well. So it, it needed to sort of really pick and choose the, the particular issues of, of focus for it. Um, I suppose one of the most interesting developments in, in the Pacific is we see the re-engagement of the US, and particularly interesting is sort of probably Fiji's engagement in IPF as well. And I think that's sort of, you know, it, you know obviously sort of there's a negotiation and so sort of there's strict confidentiality, confidentiality about what's going on within it as well, but it's pretty clear there's a new government in, in Fiji from, this, from the end of last year, and there seems to be sort of no intention to change course in terms of engagement with it. So, I mean, the US, as we know, is not negotiating market access, um, but sort of IPEF is still seen as being sort of something that would be valuable to, to a country like Fiji. It knows there will be significant costs in terms of sort of implementation and, um, and, and sort of in, in negotiation. It will stretch its capacity. But there are going to be the benefits that it's likely to achieve are going to be within the agreement, maybe capacity building, but there's also the very strong political links they will build with other countries as well, both on the officials and the ministerial level, and that's likely to be of enormous value, and, and probably Fiji is sort of already sort of experiencing some of those benefits as it is. And just sort of, the, sort of the last thing I sort of wanted to sort of make a note on, and sort of the general point, and, and sort of, you know, we've talked about sort of the WTO not being, dysfunction, being a little dysfunctional and, and sort of the US sort of pulling back on some of its sort of commitments, whether it's under the sort of the guise of national security, um, not negotiating other trade agreements. I mean, we have seen this in, in a changing form, isn't it? So IPEF in itself doesn't deal with market access. But at the other side, we also see the US, when it is negotiating on market access, negotiating very narrow agreements. You see the agreements, the bilateral agreements with China and Japan that cover sort of substantially less than substantially all trade. And uh, interestingly enough, it's sort of, you know, countries that sort of were very strong supporters of very high standards for substantially all trade have been relatively mute on, on this particular matter as well. So, you know, with these two new forms, sort of non-market access trade agreements and, and sort of very skinny trade agreements, potentially sort of the, the format and, and the structure of sort of global trade is going to start changing. Maybe not for the best, and maybe it's going to become much more complicated. But I, I think these changes may be hard to reverse. And just on sort of bringing it back to sort of um, the small countries and the small islands, I mean, one of the sort of the issues here is that sort of when you're sort of negotiating non-market access, it's sort of you're talking about sort of internal rules and sort of a whole range of different policies that may be covered. And we see sort of the, the return of the sort of the level playing field metaphor as well, which is sort of troubling in itself. And, and I think sort of one thing that there isn't really been sort of adequate thought on, and, and particularly in terms of the actual negotiations, and it's, obviously there's a certain amount of academic consideration of the matter, but there hasn't been inadequate thought of really what it sort of means to sort of try and sort of agree for common rules on sort of non-trade sort of issues within these agreements. 
And some of the rules agreed actually sort of are very, going to be very difficult for smaller countries to sort of implement. They're designed for larger countries and, and sort of more established, more mature bureaucracies and sort of larger companies itself. And I think there's sort of a need to think about sort of in terms of sort of the principles. If we're going to have non-market access trade agreements, we need to start thinking about some of the principles that should actually guide those um, particular agreements itself. So it's not something that just becomes a burden for particularly small countries with sort of limited capacity. Um, so thank you. That's. Kiora Tatao, and uh, good, af good afternoon, I think it is now. Um, thank you very much to Jennifer and Suzanne for the opportunity to be here, and also my thanks to the previous speakers for um, a lot of very enlightening observations. And in relation to that, because I'm going to speak mostly about regional trade developments and their implications for New Zealand, I just want to emphasise that I completely subscribe to the comments that Shiro made about the importance of the WTO and it's critical, the critical threats that it's now faced and the implications of these four countries around the world, including New Zealand. So the fact that I won't talk about that does not mean that I don't subscribe to everything that Shiro said. <laughs> OK. Um, I am going to focus a little on um, New Zealand and its trade, and I'll begin, if I may, if there's a um, slide that might go up on the screen. Yep. This, uh, so I'll begin with this slide, which shows the shares in New Zealand's total exports by regional country at two time points, five years apart, 2017 and 2022. And I think this, I have broken the rules of the of ATIPS with Susan and, Suzanne and Jennifer's permission, but I think this slide does show quite an interesting picture. It shows that East Asia accounts for almost 60% of New Zealand's exports, and that um, share has grown. And within that, China, as we all know, I think, accounts for 30% of New Zealand's exports. So um, while we focus on our dependence on China for our exports, um, if we look at the whole East Asian picture, um, East Asia comes into the picture very much as well because um, East Asia as a whole accounts for almost 60% of our exports. Um, Australia, the next largest export destination, and very surprisingly to me, the share of Australian exports actually fell between 2017 and 2022. That was actually a shock to me and is something perhaps that needs more investigation, especially given the theme of this uh, uh, policy school. The US is pretty stable, accounting for around 10% of our exports. Our new trade partners, the EU and the UK, accounting for um, around 7% and 2 to 3% respectively. And then finally, um, India, a very, very small part of our export portfolio, which I will say a little bit more about um, in a minute. So I think it's as well, I think, to bear in mind just where our exports are focused and the enormous concentration of our exports on East Asia, not only on China. Um, the second slide, I look at the trade agreements that we have um, covering this trade. And this, this slide shows the share of New Zealand's total exports um, covered by the members of particular trade agreements. And you can see there that the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which was not even mentioned by the Minister this morning, um, the members of that agreement account for over 60% of our trade. Um, and you can see next to that the CPTPP, um, the members of that account for about 25% of our, of our exports. And then you have the CPP incremental, that is the share of our exports accounted for by CPTPP members that are not already covered by other trade agreements. In other words, we're talking there about Canada, Mexico, Chile and Peru. Um, so the incremental value of the CPTPP in terms of new coverage of our exports that have not been covered before is actually very, very small. Of course, there are new applicants, China, Taiwan, uh, maybe Korea, um, and the UK uh, are all applying to join, and of course that will change that picture. Um, but all of those applicants are also already covered by existing trade agreements that we have. So the question is, what is the 
incremental value of the CPTPP with its very strong provisions um, in many areas for New Zealand's trade. And I'd have to say, as a cautionary note on, a, on a evaluating that, that the CPTPP, of course, is the outgrowth of the original TPP, and the outcome of the TPP was not particularly positive for New Zealand in agricultural trade, which is one of the main areas of trade where New Zealand uh, does not um, enjoy particularly good access to markets in many parts of the world. Um, then you see the other partners, the um, NZEU FTA, uh, the UK FTA, the FTA with Taiwan, and FTA with um, uh, the um, Hong Kong. And finally, PESA Plus, right down there. And you also see that our FTAs, our FTAs now cover um, almost 80% of our trade. And if we had FTAs with the United States and India, that would climb to 90%. So in terms of uh, one response to what's happening in the world economy and diversification, um, one response is to secure trade agreements with as many of our trading partners as possible. Uh, New Zealand has done rather well. Of course, the quality of these agreements vary, and that's something that needs to be considered. But we now are in a position where most of our uh, trade, export trade is covered by one or sometimes two or sometimes three or four trade agreements uh, uh, involve individual countries. Um, and of course the RCEP, the, the, the RCEP um, includes China, Japan, Korea, all of Southeast Asia and Australia. So um, we do of course have agreements with Australia, with China, with, with Korea and with Southeast Asia, both individually and as a group but I've just put all those together under RCEP as, in terms of the trade coverage. And the RCEP does have, while at the, some of the other agreements we have with the members of RCEP, um, higher quality than RCEP, particularly the CER arrangements with Australia. Um, RCEP does have one feature which is very important in that, it, in that it has common rules of origin across the region which are designed to build, bind the East Asian region together more tightly than it already is encouraging the development of supply chains, the uh, operation of supply chains across the region. Okay, so um, going on from that, uh, and as by way of background, and looking again at the uh, role of East Asia in New Zealand's trade, I'd just like to share with you some key takeaways from the uh, IMF's latest regional economic outlook for Asia and the Pacific. China and India together in the IEMF projections accounts for half of global growth projected for this year, which does raise the question, why are we not doing more with India? Why wasn't that perhaps on New Zealand's trade agenda for the coming year? Um, and um, the rest of Asia accounts and addition, contributes an actual, additional quarter of world growth. I should say that for the IMF, Asia includes South Asia. But there you have three quarters of world growth accounted for by China, India and the rest of Asia. Um, in 2023, Asia and the Pacific is projected to be by far the most dynamic of the world's major regions and a bright spot in a slowing global economy. The region as a whole projected to grow at 4.7% in 2023, um, up from 3.8% in 2022. And so it goes on. Um, I won't go, won't go on with the rest of the uh, quotes, um, except to come down to a couple of points the IMF makes about China's role. China's demand absorbs one quarter of Asia, Pacific, Asia and the Pacific region's exports, and for every percentage point of higher growth in China, growth output in the rest of Asia rises by around 0.3%. So if we look at what this means for New Zealand, the first point, the thing it obviously means is that our trade, our export trade, is centred in the world's most dynamic region. So in terms of uh, thinking about our vulnerabilities, um, we're doing trade in the right part of the world, essentially, is what comes out of this. Um, and it also, I think, is important to recognise, and the IMF comments uh, point to it, that China and the rest of East Asia should be viewed as a dynamic trade and economic ecosystem, I would like to call it, um, with the economic performance in parts of the eco ecosystem mutually interacting with each other. East Asia other than China benefits from its relationships with China and China benefits from its relationships with the rest of East Asia to a very, very significant degree. Um, 
And part of the region's dynamism is that the production and transport configurations change in, re in response to economic circumstances, sometimes also changing politics. For example, investors are responding to rising labour costs and other costs of China, as you would expect, by shifting production from China to countries like Vietnam. And I'll indicate later that China, in turn, should be uh, responding to those same economic conditions by moving up the value chain into new areas of production, moving away from uh, the uh, types of production that are based on cheap labour. So clearly the economic performance of the entire ecosystem as I describe it is heavily influenced by the performance of the Chinese economy. And that, so the Chinese economy is important uh, to East Asia and the East Asian ecosystem. It's important to us because the East Asian ecosystem is important to us. It's also important to us because almost 30% of our exports um, are directed to China. So we raise the, raise the question of um, the degree of dependence on a single export market. Um, so we need to, I think, to understand where the, our, our, our place in this uh, developing region, we need to understand um, exactly what is happening in China. We need to see China as it is, not as it might be reported in some very misleading press commentaries, um, and what that means for both the economic health of East Asia as a whole and what it means for our trade dependence on China. So in the, in the media, I'm afraid to say, we often see um, uh, some fairly uh, misleading coverage of factors that might or may adversely affect China's economic performance or in some versions lead to China's eco imminent economic collapse. Some of this is spin combined with wishful thinkings, but others, other, other comments are certainly grounded in reality. And we, those are the things we need to pay attention to. As I say, we need to uh, uh, assess China as a trading partner as it is, not as it might be misleadingly portrayed in some parts of the media. So I'll quickly run through some of these comments and, and, and comment on how far there are grounds of concern over each of them. There's a sound bite that we still hear often in the media. The days of double-digit growth in China are over. Well, that's not yesterday's news. That's news from 10, 15 years ago. Um, the inevitable end of double-digit growth in China was recognised by then Premier Wen Jiabao in 2007 with his famous Four Uns speech, where he described the double-digit growth model of the time as unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated and ultimately unsustainable. And over the following years, growth targets in China were scaled down to more realistic and sustainable levels, and in the pre-pandemic years, growth targets of 6 to 7 per cent were generally regarded as realistic, um, ma maximum achievable. Um, oops, oh, mis misplaced my. Uh, uh, sorry, I've got muddled here. Yeah, yeah, I need page. Sorry, just a minute. Ah. Okay, yeah, so basically um, looking at China's growth, if we, when we want to assess whether China is doing well or not, the question really is how close does it get to what may be its sustainable maximum growth rate of, say, 6% or, six, or just over 6%. Um, the IMF is projecting 4.4% growth for China in the coming year, which is lower than that, but it's still a very substantial contribution to global and regional, global and regional growth. Secondly, there's a lot of talk about China's dual circulation framework. It's, it's said in some quarters that China is cutting itself off from the world market. Um, this is not actually the case. Um, it's really a reflection of the unsustainability of the earlier growth model that was based on unsustainable levels of public and private investment and a level of dependence on exports that the GFC demonstrated was excessively risk risky. So China has actually been in the process over many years of rebalancing its economy and what that essentially means is reducing the dependence on exports, reducing the level of investment to more sustainable levels and that essentially requires an increase in consumption 
as the main driving as a, a, a main driving factor in China's economic growth. And what we should be looking for um, in looking at the health of China's future development prospects is the level of consumption, the role of consumption in the Chinese economy. Um, that will what is happening to, China, to consumption as China moves out of the COVID lockdown price, uh, period. What happens to consumption will be a good indicator of what's likely to happen to the Chinese economy in the future and also its demand for um, imports. Um, China does face serious demographic challenges as declining fertility rates are beginning to reflect it in a fall in the size of the labour force and also eventually a fall in China's total population. This is not new to China. Um, they've been looking at this for at least the last six years. It's not unique to China. Japan and Korea um, began to face this issue many years ago and many other European countries also face this issue. Um, so the response in China to face, and other countries that face this demographic challenge, the alternative response, which they should be making anyway, is to involve, to, to, is to uh, uh, promote productivity improvements which are move, associated with moving up the value chain to more sophisticated production processes, an upskilled labour force, and improved management. In other words, moving away from the type of production structure that um, uh, underpin China's role as the factory of the world, and crucially, more advanced technology, which brings us to a further externally imposed impediment to China's economic growth, what some US commentators call the US declaration of economic war on China, involving a very determined effort to cut China off completely from access to advanced microchip technology, whether supplied directly from the US or from third countries like Korea and the Netherlands, who are being heavily pressured by the US to comply with the US imposed ban. Now China does have the technical capacity, according to experts, to produce its own microchips from within its own resources, but it will take five years for them to get to the point where that can happen. So they face, potentially, if the US ban succeeds, five years without access to advanced microchips and the impact on China's growth um, is uncertain, but is not likely to be very positive. Uh, one of the reasons, um, one of the fa factors that... Um, OK, I'm, I might stop there. I was just going to say also that the other factor impeding China's economic growth is the rate, the size and the influence of the state-owned sector. Again, this is often overemphasised because the private sector, contrary to many reports, remains a very important and dynamic part of the Chinese economy, but the productivity of the state-owned sector, which is a very large part of the economy, is well known as being much less than the productivity of the private sector, and so this has been holding back China's economic growth, according to Nicholas Lardy in Washington, by two percentage points per year, which is a very substantial um, uh, uh, net downward impact on China's growth. So essentially, when we look at China's um, role, both in East Asia and its role as our, by far our largest trading partner, um, China's economic growth is, faces some headwinds. Not many of those headwinds are facing other countries as well. And in general, you would, I would personally say that China is likely to um, navigate those headwinds, remaining a strong, relatively strong economy and a re relatively strong trading partner. The one big doubt that I do have is the um, trade, the economic war that the United States has launched. And we've Shiro talked about sanctions, the question of uh, what further sanctions the United States might impose on China and what um, cooperation it might require from other countries to support those sanctions do have the potential to do enormous damage to the Chinese economy um, and also to um, China's trading partners, including New Zealand. Um, and, there are sort of things being talked about which really scare me, uh, but I don't want to mention them because hopefully they won't come to pass. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists. Um, this panel was actually subtitled Challenges for New Zealand, Australia and the Pacific, and our panelists have given extraordinary insights into many of those challenges ranging from the geopolitical and securitization of trade, the restructuring of supply chains, domestic protectionism, the trashing of the WTO, and the shift to minilateralism.
But along with every challenge, I think often there's an opportunity, if only in how one gets out of it. And it was really good to hear a, a very timely reminder that three quarters of world growth will be in the broad Asian region in the coming year. Um, it was excellent to be reminded also that the capacity constraints and needs of different countries vary enormously. Um, as you were talking about the capacity constraints of the Pacific Island countries and the need to ensure that the rules and principles of whatever we have going forward are fit for purpose um, for a whole variety of countries in their circumstances. That was um, one of my big takeaways. We're in good time uh, in terms of the agenda and what I believe there are two microphones roving in the room. So please put your questions to the panelists. If you want to a particular person to, to answer your question, please identify them. Um, we have one here. Uh, kia ora. Um, thank you very much, speakers. My name is Amy. I'm from MFAT the, on the ASEAN desk. Um, I have a question for Dr Armstrong, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone in the room, but um, do you think it was a good call from New Zealand and Australia to join IPF in, in the way that... Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, what's the alternative? And I was going to talk a bit about this tomorrow in the context of China and CPTPP as well. Um, um, you know, IPEF is far from ideal, um, but it's what the United States has put out as its, its way of engaging economically. Um, it's extremely important for Australia and New Zealand to actively shape it um, and engage the United States locking them into this part of the world economically um, and to make it a better agreement than otherwise. Uh, and I think uh, that's, that's pretty uncontroversial, despite all its flaws and the problems we have. Um, and we might wish it to be more like CPTPP and market access in the United States and not done through executive order and all the problems. Um, but what it's got going for it I think is that with the ASEAN members in there, the Southeast Asian members in there, and Australia and Japan's economic interests as well, and New Zealand's, it's not going to be an anti-China agreement. Um, I would be very surprised and worried if it turns into a sort of a containment vehicle. Um, the United States might be wishing it so, um, but um, the rest of the membership is just it's not in our economic um, or strategic interests for that to happen. Hi, um, I have a question addressed to anybody that wants to answer it, um, and I'm interested in knowing how this ch changing trade landscape discussion relates a little bit more to technical barriers to trade or non-tariff barriers to trade, um, and then building on that, we've heard a lot about bilateral and multilateral agreements. I'm wondering if you think those type of agreements are an effective vehicle to deal with the sort of protectionism that comes through non-tariff barriers? Thanks, it was a great question and I'm actually glad you raised the issue of non-tariff barriers because even though I didn't mention it in my talk, it's actually another area I agree is of great concern and often we see now in emerging protectionism a lot of the barriers that are emerging are non-tariff barriers. Um, in terms of what frameworks are best to address them, I think there are already great frameworks there that we have in our free trade agreements um, that can be built on to advance that. But I think alongside that what we really need to do is perhaps support more rigorous analysis and assessment of what those barriers are and how they actually impact across supply chains. Because looking at non-tariff barriers in isolation or purely in one sector tends not to resonate in terms of um, demands for reform. So I think, and again, I'm putting, I'm putting my APEC hat on here, but I think the importance of understanding 
what the barriers are, where they have impact and who they're actually affecting is an important way of trying to garner support for actually addressing them in the frameworks we have or through new frameworks. Yeah, I think uh, non-tariff barriers are where all the action is. It's where all um, the inhibitors for trade and investment economic exchange are now because um, in Australia, New Zealand, much of this part of the world, tariff barriers are pretty much gone. Um, so uh, yes, we can address those in bilateral agreements, um, uh, but I would argue even there, it's probably pretty important to try to address them um, in a way that doesn't give preferential access because um, you're just complicating things. You know, um, talked about Bhagwati and the spaghetti, spaghetti bowl. Bhagwati, his book was actually titled Termites and the Trading System. He thought bilateral agreements were damaging to the multilateral system. Now, they haven't turned out to be that damaging, but we should make our liberalisation in these, uh, getting rid of these non-tariff barriers, more multilateral um, um, than preferential. Uh, and just a plug for uh, recent work that the Australian Productivity Commission did on the tariff barriers, the remaining few tariff barriers. They did a report on nuisance tariffs last year and estimated that compliance costs with these remaining few tariffs are much higher than any revenue you're going to collect from the tariffs. Uh, and we should just get rid of all of them. Now, that's not a surprise. You know, there are a few tariff lines at 5%. Um, and I imagine it's the same here in New Zealand. Um, why should we have these tariffs? What, what purpose do they serve except for um, costs? Now, you know, we haven't been able to get rid of them because the vested interest here is trade negotiators. You know, you'll be giving up negotiating coin and they're important apparently for negotiating with the European Union. Um, uh, that's a pretty strange idea to me. So just to put that on the table, thanks. Yeah, I might just add that um, I think that when you talk about removing non-tariff barriers, um, uh, you have to remember that they are all basically regulations which are imposed and also managed by particular government agencies in each country. And experience has shown, not my experience, but my colleague Ivan Lucas over there would tell you many stories as a negotiator that the only time you really make progress in a trade negotiation on non-tariff barriers is when you bring the regulators of each side into the same room and discuss what the purpose of the regulation is and look at and look at um, uh, ways in which they, the, the barriers or these um, regulations can be modified to reduce their trade restrictive um, uh, um, effect but at the same time satisfy the legitimate purposes of each regulatory body. So it's essentially a matter of how you set up the regulation, the negotiations that has a huge part to play in whether trade agreements will actually um, be successful in removing these um, non-tariff barriers. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā uh, Thanks everybody, that was an awesome panel. My question's for Chris. So although there are, I guess, overarching comments you can make as the Pacific region as a whole, there is huge diversity and huge differences and obviously the relationships that Aotearoa and many of the other Pacific Islands have globally and that affects their trade and, and their, where they're going to go with that. So I was just wondering whether you have, I guess, any more insight on the differences that there might be throughout the Pacific region, whether that's broken down Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, or ever, even if there's specific countries that you see taking a, a larger role than others throughout the Pacific. Thank you. I don't know. Um, that's a very big, very question. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, all, all of the Pacific Islands are very different as well. And, and there is a tendency you know, for a lot of people in New Zealand looking out to see, well, they're all the same. And, and Australia is even worse and sort of if you go to the Northern Hemisphere as well. Um, so the trade interests are uh, sort of very different and the capacity is very different as well. And, and so we see, you know, the larger ones um, adopting slightly different positions, so Fiji and PNG, obviously, sort of, um, they, they have more capacity and, and a, a greater diversity of interest to, to advance and protect as well, more local manufacturing and, and, and other opportunities. Um, yeah, and, and so the, of, they're the countries that are attracting the attention from sort of the major powers as well, first off as well. So 
if uh, China is interested in the region, discusses so it's discussing things with with uh, Papua New Guinea and Fiji and and others and and sort of the United States. Where where is it interested in? It's obviously it's got its framework agreement with Fiji. Fiji's part of IPF, so so it sort of makes sense that you expect the countries, and these countries do have more capacity to and and sort of a, a broader sort of regulatory base as well. So yeah, it's, it's going to be very different. I'm, I'm not sure really I'm answering your question, but sort of just paraphrasing it. But um, um, so there is you know there is a lot of difference between the countries and, and what we can really expect in the future as well, and that complicates sort of. You, know, you go back 20 years, there was sort of a focus on sort of intra-Pacific cooperation and trade. And I think sort of the reality is that that's going to be very difficult to sort of really grow to substantially because the economies, a lot of them are very similar. Um, the ones that sort of potentially could trade, they're not necessarily linked with good transport routes as well. And so there's sort of complications there as well. So, so yeah, I'll stop there, thanks. Uh, thank, thanks very much. My name's uh, Catherine Grant uh, again. Um, I have uh, two questions, if I may, just brief ones. One to pick up on the point uh, that Chris made, reflecting on his sort of view from a Pacific Island perspective, which I think was really helpful. Uh, and uh, Kristen's point about a lot of the action these days being around services, uh, digital economy type issues in the trade space and the move away from market access. How, how are we going to address the capacity challenges in the Pacific when we come into these newer issues uh, in trade conversations like IPEF, for example? You've spoken about capacity constraints at the outset being one of the biggest challenges. Uh, Aren't they going to be even greater if we are talking about some of these uh, newer types of trade agreements? That's my one question, and and how do we deal with that? And on a related point, um, some of the points that were made brought to my mind the linkage between trade and development and the aid for trade space. And I'd be interested in the views of, of Shiro and others about whether that set of linkages that we have seen coming into the WTO and some of the more recent agreements like trade facilitations and also to a certain extent fish subsidies of linking trade to packages of assistance to development support. What's your view on that? Is, is that going to be something that could help us going forward or is it uh, not useful? Thanks. Shall I start off? Um, yeah, I mean, the capacity constraints are going to be a big issue as well. I mean, I, I suppose there's a number of different things to it as well, and, and sort of it's, it's wrong to lump it all together. I mean, some of the capacity constraints, uh, that's what I was thinking immediately about, is really the capacity to negotiate and, and talk about it and coordinate to try and get a hold of government. You think about IPEF, you know, the, the number, the breadth of things that are potentially covered by that, and, and most modern trade agreements, CPTPP. Um, so... Yeah, it, it, it's a challenge for, for, the, for sort of small governments to, to negotiate it. I mean, there's also the capacity in terms of sort of the implementation, compliance, and, and making sure other people comply as well. And there's different sorts of capacity constraints that are involved in that as well. Um, sometimes the agreements are not well designed and, and sort of they sort of demand quite a lot of sort of smaller countries and in terms of sort of whether it's meetings, reports, processes, things that don't necessarily make a lot of sense in terms of what you want to achieve from it. There's a lack of sort of proportionality that's sometimes brought to these, particularly in sort of the broader sort of negotiations, the multilateral negotiations as well. Um, aid for trade and capacity building, I mean, it's clearly going to be sort of a very important issue for, um, for, for the Pacific countries, and, and you think about IPF as well. Clearly, it's one of the key things. I mean, PESO Plus, the, one of the, the key drivers, if not the most important driver for sort of uh, the signature for that as well, was probably the promise of Australia and New Zealand for reasonably significant, not huge, but reasonably significant sums of um, assistance. Of course, that was outside of the trade agreement itself. And the trade agreement sort of creates this context where there is a greater connection um, and a sense of uh, sort of a common purpose and sometimes as well. And I think that drives uh, you know, the, the desire for this, you know, for, from the political view of it as well. The capacity is 
also the capacity to connect uh, to people at a particular senior level and, and sort of partner governments. Um, and, and from that comes the opportunities of an aid for trade, not necessarily formally part of it, but they're sort of in parallel to that arrangement as well. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think packaging trade with development, um, I think, is a, a good idea. And you mentioned two examples, trade facilitation, fisheries. Trade facilitation, um, I think it's a simple matter of there are very few losers in that kind of arrangement, which raises a question why India and others were vetoing the arrangement initially. But that's simply thinking about a, a cost-benefit analysis if you can help um, build capacity in, in some countries where they need it, managing their ports or systems, um, uh, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, do a bit of a cost-benefit analysis and it's a, it's a huge win. On fisheries, you know, there's a bit more of a trade-off, I think, um, and compromises, and I'm not against having to buy off countries um, um, that have strong opposition. Again, you can do a bit of a cost-benefit analysis if you, if you want, but here you're trying to get out of a sort of stalemate towards a win-win outcome. Um, uh, so that, that's how I would think about it, I suppose. We have a, a question in the middle. I just want to Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to um, just add on the capacity building. I agree. I think it's really, really important. Um, just because it does help build that deep collaboration and those deep relationships that help with further cooperation. So it just... It's sort of where the conversations, I guess, among the weeds and the officials across different agencies and across different levels of government that help to build, build that collaboration that then leads on to better policy making in future. Um, we could have one of the mics in the middle of the room. Um, sorry, I was at a question. <laughs> oh, sorry, and also at that end. Well, you, you already have a mic. So yeah. I'll, I could ask if that's right. Um, so I'm Patrick. I've just started in uh, the trade law unit at Foreign Affairs and Trade. And my question was about the WTO appellate body. I heard one of the panellists talking about it earlier. And I just wanted um, the panel's reflections on possible pathways forward with regards to that deadlock. Yeah, so since um, the end of 2019, we haven't had a functioning appellate body. So, um, you know, countries appeal the decision um, that's been made in the panel and you appeal into the void. Um, and it's far from ideal. Like I said, we don't have enforceable WTO rules. Um, now, there are obviously, uh, it wasn't a perfect system and the United States is um, not happy with it, but instead of reforming it, um, um, made sure it doesn't function. Now, you know, we've gotten to the stage where at Geneva last year, an MC12 um, agreement to try to resolve this by the end of 2024, 20, end of next year. And that's a bit of progress, I suppose, but I'm pretty um, pessimistic about this in a, a US election year, um, given where the US administration's at. Um, uh, it's holding the whole system to hostage, really, to try to get its own way. I think we need a pretty clear strategy towards resolution of this, and part of that has to be this MPIA arrangement, multi-party interim arbitration arrangement, that New Zealand, Australia, China, Singapore have signed on to in this part of the world. You know, I didn't mention Japan, South Korea, and a bunch of others, Indonesia. But it's pretty important, the 26, 27 or so uh, WTO members led by the European Union um, that have basically replicated uh, that appellate body. Uh, that gives us insurance so that the US can't hold the whole system hostage. So, you know, Australia will challenge, has challenged China uh, in the WTO, and that will not be appealed into the void um, if it goes that far. Uh, so I think that's a pretty uh, important strategy alongside um, trying to fix the dispute settlement system in the WTO um, and, and reform that. Now, what can be done about the other um, countries in our region that we want to have as part of this MPIA? I think trying to encourage them um, strongly uh, and trying to um, use every opportunity we can at these regional forums to just signal interest in keeping that hope alive because um, we want Japan to sign up. Japan um, 
is having a real battle within its government that I think the, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry has lost to the foreign ministry folks um, about this. Because it becomes about, well, the US alliance versus um, our support for the rules-based order, and that's a pretty, pretty harsh position to put yourself in, I think. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Thomas A. Sarr. I'm the uh, Russia Sanctions Task Force at the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, you know, in response to you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, New Zealand enacted its first ever um, set of sanctions, and they did them uh, in response to a specific situation where you know, the UN was unlikely to act. And um, you know, since we have done that, we've seen trade um, drop to 1% uh, of what it was pre-COVID effectively decoupling the um, Russian and New Zealand economies. And we've seen a large coalition of sanctioned partners, EU, Canada, Australia, UK, Japan, Switzerland. And um, I'm just kind of wondering, my question is, what does the future of sanctions look like for Australia and New Zealand? You know, are they here to stay? I mean, Robert Mugabe is still sanctioned by the uh, United States, despite being dead. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think um, one response would be to say we just uh, breathe deeply and hope for the best, but actually the future could be pretty scary. Um, I mean, we, don't, don't, we have already, quite apart from the Ukraine sanctions, we already have the United States effectively sanctioning exports of um, advanced microchips to China, not only from itself, but from any other country that has that technology, um, putting a lot of pressure on the other countries, and obviously they are succumbing to it. Um, the way that the sanctions were operated against Russia obviously raises questions in China, among other countries, what happens if the same sanctions are applied to us? And we know that China is working very hard to reduce its vulnerability to that kind of, those kind of sanctions. But because, I mean, for example, excluding Russia or China from the um, international financial system so they can't trade is one possibility. Um, and um, so China, for example, is trying to develop its own digital currency so that uh, its trade doesn't have to be dependent on the US dollar. That's a very difficult um, task to achieve because the, um, China or any other country starts way behind the United States in terms of the role of the United States dollar as a reserve currency. So it is still potentially possible for the for, for Russia, for China, sorry, for the United States to exclude any country it chooses from the international trading system by imposing sanctions on them. And as it happened with Iran, somebody mentioned that, um, if they were to um, impose sanctions on China, that would remove China from the international trading system, which would mean that 30% of our exports potentially go up in the dust immediately. Now, I talked about scary things that I didn't want to talk about. That's one of those things I didn't want to talk about because I hope it never happens. But we are seeing... Um, the United States saying that it believes China is about to supply military equipment to Ukraine and the possibility has to be exist that the United States would then apply the same sort of sanctions on China as it's applied on Russia for the same reason and the pressure would go on all uh, China's trading partners or all the supporters of the sanctions against Russia to apply the same sanctions um, against China and that's a really, really scary um, scenario for countries like New Zealand. So, yeah, I hope none of these things happen but there are these scary possibilities out there. Yeah. Um, you know, I spoke about sanctions when I, I presented before. I think they're, what we have to be pretty careful of is, is the limits and getting constraints around them. Um, so, you know, they're permissible um, part of statecraft when we're talking about violations of the peace and they're put on multilaterally, um, in this case, uh, on Russia. Now, um, I think we've got to be pretty clear with the intention and communicate what we expect from them to the public uh, because they're not going to um, um, immediately stop um, a war. Um, we've got to have clear exit strategies and off-ramps to provide incentive anyway to uh, resolution of conflict. Um, uh, and in this case, of course, we've seen far too much leakage and energy dependence on Russia for them to work. Um, 
they are instead of boots on the ground and, and firing weaponry. Um, so I think it's a matter of communicating that to the public of what the expectations are. Um, because we are creeping into a world where they're not just used for these purposes, but they're used for reasons that, um, you know, Rob's explained some of them, um, the uni unilateral extraterritorial sanctions the United States is putting on, on Chinese tech sector. So there's a danger in allowing them to become acceptable in, in state, usual statecraft for, you know, global economic affairs, uh, like they're starting to, and including the WTO uh, national security exception that's been let out of the, the box since um, uh, annexation of Crimea. So I think we're in a pretty dangerous place where, yes, there are unintended consequences, um, uh, but, um, and I failed to make this point when I spoke, they're still extremely costly, right? So Australian exporters did suffer a lot the hands of these sanctions from China, although as, uh, for the reasons I mentioned, uh, the effects were blunted, uh, still extremely costly, and I think we need to figure out a way to put these sanctions back in their box, if that's possible at all. I think we do, we do have time for one question, if there is one hand up there. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, Helen Churchman here from the Ministry for Primary Industries. Um, so I'm going to take us back from that really scary place um, <laughs> to one of agricultural tariffs. Um, and I did appreciate, Rob, uh, when you pointed out um, tariff reductions and FTA coverage, uh, the comment that you made that agriculture has not always been perfectly covered um, in those FTAs. In a time of non-market access agreements um, and skinny FTAs and, frankly, rising protectionism, can you see a way forward in terms of reducing those final um, tariffs in agriculture, uh, or is that game too hard and we simply need to be looking at things like NTBs and other areas for um, future tariff liberalisation and um, better support for our agricultural sectors? Thanks. Uh, yeah, um, you, you are right that um, agriculture doesn't fare too well in many of our trade agreements and it didn't fare, it didn't fare very well in the TPP as you know um, and therefore probably won't fare very well in the CPTPP either. Um, but we do see some trade agreements where things go much better. So for example the trade agreement with the UK um, where we are going to get complete market access apparently after a, an implementation period. Um, what that means is uh, and, and the other possibility, which we also see in the EU FDA, is the use of tariff rate quotas, um, which allow um, the export of restricted quantities, but able to be sold at a price much higher, potentially, than the world market price, so that New Zealand or other countries that hold these quotas can capture a quota rent, which in some cases can and uh, sometimes does more than offset the restriction on the volume that you're able to export. So there are different ways of skinning a cat. And um, we've also seen, for example, in Japan, I think the quota rents on exports of some of their products to Japan in the past have been very, very profitable. So there are different ways that can be chosen. They have different implications. So for example, in the case of the um, UK FDA, what's happening is that New Zealand is giving up, sorry, is giving up the possibility of uh, acquiring quota rents that it enjoyed under the original EU uh, tariff rate quotas under the WTO. So that's giving up something, but UK consumers are benefiting because they get New Zealand products at lowest possible prices. In the case of the um, e EU FDA, New Zealand is likely to benefit substantially from quota rents, although that's not been acknowledged here in the primary sector, but there probably will be. I'm sure there are going to be substantial quota rents, but you, EU consumers miss out because uh, and also some of our competitors miss out. So there, there are pluses and minuses with every way, but I do agree um, every, almost every developed country, apart from the agricultural exporting countries, has major sensitivities in the agricultural sector, the United States as well, um, which, which mean that negotiating um, access for agricultural products is going to be very, very difficult in the foreseeable future. 
One possibility is that uh, progress might be made in the WTO. Um, that again runs into the opposition from um, Europe, United States, um, the North, Northern, Northern European countries, Japan, Korea. But it's also the case, I think, that agricultural market access is very dear to developing countries as a, as a, as a group. And if we are ever going to get the WTO back on track, back into, into proper functioning mode, the support of the developing countries is going to have to be um, gained. And it may well be that developing countries might take the position, well, if you want the WTO to work properly, you're going to really have to do something about agriculture at long last. So that might be pie in the sky, but it's a possibility that I... That's the only way I could see um, progress being made in the WTO at the moment. In that case, um, I, we've had a, a terrific panel. Um, we've covered so much terrain from the big picture to the small tapestry fine print. And um, I do note that we've added three more metaphorical animals to our repertoire. We've got termites, elephants, and cats. Um, it is one o'clock, I believe, or we've just gone. Um, hopefully, only two, two minutes over, and it was well worth it. So I'd like to thank the panelists. Um, for a great session. Thank you.